faithfulness to join with us in the worship and the praise of our Lord. And we pray that all we do and that all we say will honor the Lord and it will be uplifting to the church. We thank God for all those who have joined with us today in this assembly and also to our friends who view us by the way of television and the internet. We thank God for this opportunity to worship with you. So now for our call to worship, please join us in singing the hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. You'll find out on page 589 in our hymnal. Shall we stand as we sing? What a friend we have in Jesus. standing now for the invocation. Let us pray. Our dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord God, we just come before the throne humbly thanking you, Lord, this morning for all that you do for us, for your love, mercy, and grace. Father, for the opportunity we have to be here in your house this morning, Lord, and to be able to bring prayer and petition to you, Lord, but mostly to bring praise and glory to your precious name. Father, we pray that you'll be with the service this morning and everything that goes on here today, Lord. We pray that you'll be right in the center of it, Lord. And Lord, we just pray that all the songs sung and all the words spoken, Lord, will be centered around you. Help us to always be faithful to everything you'd have us to do and what you'd have us to be. And, Lord, we'll not fail to praise you for it. And we love you in Jesus' precious, wonderful name we do pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Be seated. What a joy it is to be in God's house this morning. If you're glad to be here, say amen. Amen. I tell you, I'm glad to be here. I'm thankful that God has blessed us to be able to return once again to his house to worship him in spirit and truth, to join with our our family in Christ and just have a good time today in the services. That's what we're here for is to worship him and to give him praise, honor, and glory. Let me say thank you again for being here today. But let me say thank you for to a lot of you who knew about it for praying for us this week, praying us home on Wednesday. 
It took me twice as long to get home Wednesday as I should have, and I was sick as a dog. And uh, y'all started praying, some of you who knew about it, and, and prayed us home and, and prayed us through this stuff that we've had, and uh, I feel much better. Thank you for your love and your cards that you sent this week and your prayers. Uh, just uh, thank you for being my family. Thank you for being my family in Christ. And, and I tell you, truly, you are closer than my physical family to us. And to Sandy and I, and we love you, and we thank you for all that you have done for us this week and, and so much. We're here to honor the Lord today, and I trust that's why you're here, and I trust that your need of your heart will be met. God's prepared this service and uh, moved in the minds and hearts of the folks who planned the music and then in the message today, so we're here to honor him. Open your hymn books again to page 444. Let's sing, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Brother Jack. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. in his life. 
6. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Anytime you see the word wherefore or therefore, it tells you why the, re the re rest of this text is there. Let me just give you a quick summation. The beginning of the chapter, Paul is talking about the faith of young Timothy's mother and grandmother, saying that he had been raised in a God-fearing home by God-fearing parents. But because he was raised in that condition doesn't necessarily mean he carries the same ideas or thought patterns. So therefore he said, you are also saved, but this is not based on your mothers or your grandmothers. This is based on your personal relationship with God. Amen. May I tell you this morning, if we're to find encouragement, and that's what we're talking about this morning, encouragement, reasons to be encouraged, is because we have a personal relationship with Christ. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not therefore, be thou not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor me his prisoner. But be thou partaker of the, of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus before the world began but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Whereunto I, appoint, I am appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to unto him against that day. Hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. May we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this day that you blessed us with to be in your house, to be in Sunday school this morning and be encouraged by the word. And, and Father, the Lord, for the singing and the music and how it's lifted our hearts to the portals of heaven as we take time to praise you for your majesty and your glory. Now as we come to this time, the important time of looking to the word of God, I pray that the Holy Spirit would illuminate the word this morning. Speak through me, your servant. Just may I be a vessel of your communicating truth to your people today. Father, Lord, fill each heart. Encourage each person as we walk with you in this life. And Father, Lord, whatever is accomplished, we'll praise you and thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Verse 12 says, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. As you read all of Apostle Paul's writings from Romans all the way through his letters to the churches, there's one thing you notice about Apostle Paul. He was always positive. He was always positive. I almost believe if I could just have a picture of Apostle Paul, he always had a smile on his face. He always had a joy in his heart. He always had a praise on his lips. He always had a song on his tongue. He was always positive. Not one time in all of his writings do you find him ever being discouraged. Not one time in all the writings is there even a hint of discouragement or even a hint of regretting his decision of following Christ. I have never seen that in his writings. Not the first time. And in our text today, he's writing to young Timothy, the young preacher who he has won to Christ, 
who has felt the call of ministry. And he's writing to this young Timothy to encourage him in his life for Christ. May I say to you this morning that you and I need this same encouragement. And in Paul reminding Timothy, as he's written here, he is also writing this to remind us and to encourage us as he was encouraging Timothy. Let's look at some things that he's reminding young Timothy of that he may be reminding us of. Paul reminds him that he had been given the gift of ministry and had been ordained by Paul's laying on of hands. In verse 6 he says, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. He's saying to young Timothy, Timothy, wake up. Get excited. Be more active. Get busy. Why? Because you're saved. Now, let me say this. You say, well, he says that Timothy was called into ministry or had the gift of ministry and was ordained to that by the laying on of Paul's hands. May I inform you that everyone who's ever been saved has a gift of ministry. No, not preaching. Maybe not teaching. But a gift of ministry. You say, what is that ministry? Ministering the love and grace of God to everyone that we come in contact with. And we have been ordained to do so because God says that we are called unto good works. And he has ordained us to do that. So he's reminding us, get busy, wake up, quit being slothful. Awaken that gift, stir up that ministry gift that's in you. Be active for God. Sad to say we have too many inactive Christians. We have too many people sitting inactive on church pews this morning when we need everybody in the ministry today everybody that's ever been saved is called to some type of ministry so let's just get busy Paul also reminds Timothy and reminds us of all that God has given him look in verse 7 for God has not given us the spirit of fear but of power of love and of sound mind sometime I'm going to come back and preach a message on that verse. One thing God has not gave his children is a spirit of fear. Don't be afraid of what man can do to us. We as children of God, of all people, should not be afraid of things in this world. We should not be afraid of our government, of our economy. We should not be fearful of man and what they can do to us. We have no reason to be afraid. Why? Why should we not tremble when things go wrong? Why should we not worry and twist our hands and pull out our hair? Why should we lose sleep? Why should we not lose sleep over things that's happening in our world and around us today? Why? Because God says not to. And he's given us a reason not to. Look there. He's given us the power of the gift of power. But of power. He's given us a spirit of power. The power of God. That's alive and active in our hearts. He's given us the gift of love. The gift of love. The gift not only to receive love, but the gift of giving love. Showing love to others. And the gift of sound mind. A gift of knowledge of the scriptures. That's what God's done for all of us. Oh, what a reminder of what we have in Christ Jesus, of what all he has given us. Oh, what a great reminder. Thirdly, he goes on to remind him that he should be proud of what God has given him. May I say to you and I, we need to be proud of what we have been given by Christ. Look in verse 8 and 9. But be therefore, but not, be thou, not therefore ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Hey, we ought to be proud of the fact that we know the testimony of Jesus Christ. We ought to be proud of the fact that we know the testimony of the ministers of God. Those who preach to us, those who lead us, those who guide us, those who open the word, those who teach and preach the word of God. 
We ought to be proud of the testimony of the Savior. What is that? That he loved, that he loved us so much that he left heaven's be best to die for earth's worst. To go to an old rugged cross. What a testimony that he came for you and I. Listen to this. Let's move forward. Who saved us. Wow. What else could you say? Wow. Who saved us. Who called us with a holy calling. Who knew where we were and came looking for us. Who knew where we were in the depths of our sins and still wanted us. Awesome. He knew where we were. In the condition we were in. In the filth. In the rags of our righteousness. Unrighteousness. Where we shouldn't have been. But were. He came seeking for us. And he saved us. In that condition. Now how did he save us? Not according to our works. May I tell you this morning. We can never work our way to heaven. We can never be good enough to go to heaven. We can never regenerate ourselves, reform ourselves, renew ourselves enough to ever get it to heaven. Why? That wasn't God's plan. God planned to save us because he loved us, sent his son to die for us. But according to his own purpose and grace, which is given us in Christ Jesus before the world was. I don't understand what I'm getting ready to tell you. But I know it's true because God said so. In the beginning of time, whenever the time, in, before the beginning of time, God always has been. Always has been. Always will be. But somewhere before the beginning of time, before Christ stepped out on nothing and by the power of his word spoke into existence everything that we have. In the foreknowledge of the Godhead, it was designed by purpose that Christ would leave heaven, come to earth, suffer as man did, go to an old rugged cross, die there on a vicarious death after he had lived a sinless life to redeem sinful man. I don't understand it. God says it's true. It's true. All I can say is thank God for his grace, his grace, his grace, his grace, his grace. Yes. Fourthly, Paul tells him how all this was possible. Look in verse 10. But now is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. May I say to you this morning, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, you're dead and dying and will eternally die. Wow. Let me repeat that. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, you are dead in trespasses and sin. You will die physically, and you will die eternally. This is the second death. But may I say to you, those who believe the gospel will never die eternally and will live in immortality. Oh, we'll shed this robe of flesh. It will go back to from whence it came. What the Word of God says. But you and I are alive today. Have life today and have it more abundantly and have life eternal after this life. Why? Because of the appearing of Jesus Christ through the gospel. It's been brought to light through the gospel. Church, you and I who know Jesus Christ will never die. We'll live eternally in his presence, in the presence of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We will live there eternally. There is no more death for a child of God. It has no fear for us. I'm looking forward to the day. You say, preacher, you really looking forward to today? I'm looking forward to the day when Jesus Christ stands and welcomes me and all of his believers home. Oh, what a blessing. What a reminder. Fifthly, Paul reminds us, as he reminded Timothy, that because of Christ, and I believe with all, with, with, with humility, but with Christian pride, he shows Timothy and he shows us just how proud we should be in our position that Christ has given us. Look in verse 11. This is Paul talking about himself. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. You know, I believe Apostle Paul had a lot of pride about that. I really believe he was proud of the fact that he had been called an apostle, a preacher, and a teacher. 
You know what? We ought to be proud of the fact that God calls us kings and priests. That he calls us peculiar people, a royal priesthood. You and I ought to be reminding ourselves daily, as Paul reminds us, that we are somebody special in Christ Jesus. We are peculiar people zealous to good works. We should be proud, but yet with humility, of who we are in Jesus Christ. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget who you are in Christ Jesus. Don't ever sell yourself short and don't ever let the devil sit up on your shoulder and whisper in your ear that you're a nobody because I'm going to tell you everybody that's been to Jesus Christ is a somebody. And he's took nobodies and made somebodies out of all of us. And he's placed us in his family. I don't know, there is not a better family, a greater family than, than to be in the family of God, a family of royalty. I'm glad this is his family. And sixthly, Paul also wanted Timothy and us to know that life with Christ also brings suffering, but suffering was a reason, it was, was no reason to become ashamed and discouraged. It was actually a reason to be encouraged. In verse 12, he says, For the which cause I suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed. Amen. All those that live godly in Christ Jesus, the Bible says, shall suffer persecution. Oh, at times we all find times that we sort of feel discouraged. At times, things come in our life and hardships come in our life and troubles and trials come in our life and we begin to wane a little bit and we begin to get down a little bit and maybe we want to have us a little pity party for ourselves. And Why do I have to go through all these things? And Why do I suffer like this? And Why does this happen? And Why do people treat me the way they treat me? And why can't people see that I enjoy living for Jesus? And why, why does this, why does that? And we tend to ask those questions. But let me just share something with you. If anybody ever had reason to be discouraged and to give up because of what he suffered, it was Apostle Paul for the cause of Christ. Listen to this testimony in 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 28. Listen to this. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in laborers more abundant. In stripes above measures, in prisons more frequent, in deaths often. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A, night, a day and a night have I been in the deep. In journeyings often, in pearls of water, in pearls of robbers, in pearls of my own countrymen, in pearls of heathen, in pearls of the city, in pearls in the wilderness, in pearls in the sea, in pearls among false brethren, in weariness, in painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and in thirst and in fastings often, and in cold and nakedness. Besides these things that are without, that which was cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches." If I ever decide that I'm going to have a pity party, I can't stay there long. If I ever become at least a bit discouraged, I can't stay there long. Why? Because God brings back to memory all the things that Apostle Paul went through. I don't know of anybody in our church today, and I don't know I've ever met anybody in my life who suffered for the cause of Christ like the Apostle Paul did. I'm glad that we can count it an honor to suffer for Christ. Dear friends, after this introduction and encouragement to Timothy, Paul gives us reasons why we, as he, should always be encouraged. Look in verse 12. For the which cause I, off, I suffer, also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him against that day. First of all, he gives us four reasons here that we should always find encouragement. The first reason that we should be in, always be encouraged is because that we have a personal knowledge of Christ's character. We should always be encouraged because we have a personal knowledge of Christ's character. For I know whom. Underline that. For I know whom. Paul understood the character of Christ. 
to whom he had committed his eternal interest. And he knew that he had no reason to be ashamed of confiding in him. He knew Christ. May I tell you this morning, we know Jesus. If you've been saved this morning, if you've been washed in the blood of Christ, we have much reason to be encouraged this morning and find encouragement in the gospel and in the word of God and in our life with him because we know who he is. Let me just take just a minute and share with you who he is just in case we need some encouragement. First of all, the word of God says many times who he is. Let me just share a few of them. He's the almighty. He's the, there's none greater than Jesus. He is the almighty. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is the creator, and he's the one who will be the next creator, by the way. He's the bread of life. In him there is life, and without him there is no life. He says, I come to give them life, and that they might have life more abundantly. He is my bread of life. He's the bright and morning star. Oh, if you ever feel down and down, out in the darkness of this world just look to Jesus you'll find the bright and morning star he's the creator he's the first and the last he is the eternal God you see he's always been he is and he always will be no doubt about that he is he, he's the lord of lords he's the greatest ruler he is the, the eternal piate he is, he, he is the, the potentate he is the ruler of all rulers the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. He is the Messiah. He's the one that came from God to redeem fallen man. He is God's gift to sinful men. Amen? Listen to this. He's the Prince of Peace. There's no peace and no other. If you ever become down and out and things are not going just like you think you should, find peace in Christ. He's the Prince of Peace. He's my Redeemer. Oh, he's my redeemer. He's the one that gave himself for me. He took my sins on the cross of Calvary. Yeah. He bore my sins and my iniquities on his back on the tree. He took my stripes. He took my beatings. Matter of fact, he took my hell that I didn't have to go. He's the resurrection in life. I'm alive today because he lives. Because he lives. I can face tomorrow. Before, because he lives, I live. Because he lives, we all live. Because he resurrected. He's the Savior. He's the one that secures us. He's the shepherd. He's the shepherd of my flock. I'm so glad that we're the sheep of his pasture. He's a sinner's friend. Oh, don't you remember? Don't you remember when you needed that friend, that special someone? You couldn't find it in man. You couldn't find it in the world. You couldn't find it anywhere else. But you found it in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. All of our sins and griefs to bear. What a friend. He's the son of God. He's God incarnated in human flesh. God come to dwell amongst us. And I'm so glad he dwells with his children today. He's the way, the truth, and the life. The only way to come to the Father is with Christ Jesus. And by the way, just to sum it all up, he's my coming king. He's my coming king. I'm looking for him any day. Any day he could split that eastern sky. And we could hear, as it says in the book of Revelation chapter 4, come up hither and we'll be gone. Church, we have reason to be encouraged because we know Christ. If you know him this morning, take time to give him praise and glory. Amen. Hey, the second reason Paul gives us that we should always be encouraged is because of a personal faith in the word of Christ. The personal faith in Christ's word. Look, he says this in, in verse 12, For I know whom, and then he adds this, I have believed. I have exercised faith. That's what belief means. I have trusted I have exercised faith in Christ and in his word. Listen to this in John 3, 16. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You say, preacher, what are you saying? I find reason to be encouraged because I have believed who Christ is. I have believed in who Christ is, and I have believed in the faith of Christ. Let me just show you something right there in John 3, 16 through 18. It says that whosoever trusted, believe, exercise faith in Christ shall not perish, shall not go to hell, but have everlasting life. He further on and says this, that he that believeth is not condemned, is not judged. Why? Because Christ took my judgment and my condemnation on the cross. And I just by faith trusted. But then he says this as he finishes it up. For those who have not trusted, for those who have not believed, for those who have not exercised faith, Watch out, you're condemned already and you're on your way to hell. But listen to this. Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourself is a gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. We are saved by grace through the faith that God gave us. We have perfect knowledge and exercise faith in the personal word of Christ. I believe what he said. It's his faith. Listen to Paul writing to the church of the Galatians in 2.16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ, in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for the, by the works of the law shall no man be justified. Let me break this down just a little bit. This just blesses my heart. You say, well, what is the faith that we exercise? It's the faith of Christ. Twice in this verse, in Galatians 2.16, we find these words. Faith of Jesus Christ. It's not our faith. It's his faith that he gives to us to believe in all that he has done for us and is doing for us. We're not justified by the works of law. We're not justified by ourselves, but we're justified by the faith of Jesus Christ. He says this, that we are saved by the faith of Jesus Christ. We are justified by the faith of Jesus Christ. You say, what is the faith of Christ? That his Father promised and his Father will deliver. Amen. Amen. So we should be greatly encouraged if we know his faith. We should be greatly encouraged if we've exercised faith that he has given to us of himself. Oh, we should never be discouraged because we believed. We should be greatly encouraged even at the worst days of our life because we know whom we have believed. Church, we have great reason to be encouraged because we believe by faith in the faith of Christ. If you know this faith and the faith of Jesus Christ, thank him this morning and give him some praise and glory. <laughs> Thirdly, that just gets better and better. Thirdly, we should be encouraged because of a personal committal to Christ's keeping. Because we've committed personally to his keeping. Look in the last part of that verse. And I'm persuaded that he is able to, commit, to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. Paul says this, for I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. You see, salvation when it really comes right down to it, <coughs> salvation consists of one committing their soul to the care of 
the Lord Jesus. On the day of my salvation, on the day of your salvation, whether we realized it at that particular time or not, we are saying, Christ, I give you who I am, all that I am, for you to keep. And he says this, because I know the character of Christ. I know what he has done for me by dying for me on the cross of Calvary. I know what he is doing for me in giving me life and life abundantly and life eternally. I have extra, and because I have exercised my faith in the personal faith of Christ, then I willingly give him myself. Commit it to him. Give it to him in my salvation. Why should we commit, or why did we commit our souls to the keeping and care of the Lord Jesus? Because we cannot secure our own soul's salvation. It's impossibility. We can't save ourselves. We cannot secure our own soul salvation. You'll never be good enough to go to heaven. You'll never be rich enough to go to heaven. You'll never do enough works to go to heaven. You'll never be pretty enough to go to heaven. Never will. Your soul will never quit sinning enough to go to heaven. But we give it to him because we know who he is. We know what he's capable of. We know his power. We know his love. We know his commitment to us. Therefore, we commit our soul to him. We commit our soul to him because our soul is constantly in danger. Our soul is constantly in danger. But in him, there is no danger. And by the way, if we're not saved by Christ, the soul never will be saved. If your soul is not saved by Christ and what he done for you, on the cross of Calvary, it'll never be saved. Secondly, our soul is a great and invaluable treasure which must be committed to him. No higher treasure can we commit to Christ than who we are. No higher treasure can we give than to give ourselves. I tell people several times, and I've said it here in the church, don't give him your money until you give him yourself. Don't give him your money until you give him yourself. Don't give him the things that you have until he has all that you have and all that you are. The whole question of our happiness, listen to this, the whole question of our happiness on earth and in heaven is entrusted to him and depends completely on his being God. I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him against that day. Listen, this commitment is done by all true Christians with the utmost confidence, the utmost assurance, so our minds are at rest. The grounds of this confidence is not based on our profession. This grounds of this confidence is not based on us, but the grounds of the confidence that our soul rests completely in the hands of Jesus, in the protecting of the power of God. Rest our minds because of the promises of Christ. We can have great rest and assurance in our salvation because we are kept, as, first, as Peter says, by the power of God. But listen to this promise that Christ himself gives us in John 10, 27 through 29. Listen to this. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. 
Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I'm reminded of hearing many years ago an old Cajun preacher, a Louisiana Cajun preacher, who described it in this manner. He says, many years ago, this old Cajun boy was walking down the, the dirty streets of Louisiana in the swamps and the bayous. And this old dirty Cajun boy was dirty and filthy and sin. And the devil was hot on his trail. And the devil was causing and influencing the sin of my life. But one day, the mighty hand of mercy, the Lord Jesus Christ, reached down and swooped up this old Cajun boy. And I stood in his hand. And then before I knows what was going on, kept the hand of the Father over the hand of the Son. And I stand protected. And the devil couldn't find me no more. And the devil can't find me now. Because I'm secure in the hand of Jesus. Amen. Church, if you're secure in the hand of Jesus, because you've personally committed your soul and your life to him, and you are sure of his keeping, let him know you're thankful this morning. Give him praise and glory. Amen. And lastly, Paul gives us a reason that we should be encouraged because we have a personal conviction, a personal assurance that Christ's ability, in Christ's ability to keep us safe against that day. Listen to this. Read that verse 12 with me one more time. For I know, let me read, read verse 12. For the cause which I suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him against that day. He, Christ, is able to keep that, my soul, which I personally have given to him against that day. What is that day? That day of judgment. That day of judgment is called that day. It's designated a great day. The day that all other days were made for. It's the day of wrath. It's the day when God calls all men to judgment. That day was the object and the thought of the conversation amongst early Christians and it should be the conversation of us today. You say, preacher, are you sure that we're safe against the day of wrath? My Bible teaches me that we have escaped the wrath of God by the mercies of Christ. My Bible assures me that because Christ took my wrath of Calvary, I will not suffer wrath anymore. That I have escaped the penalties of sin. That I have escaped because he took my sin on the cross of Calvary. That day was the object and the thought of those early Christians. And my friends, it should be the thought and the object of churches today. It certainly is the object of this church. That day is the day that they were always preaching about and always talking about and always thinking about. And may I say to you this morning that because we have those that we love and those that we want to know Christ who are facing that great day of wrath that you and I have escaped. You and I should always be talking about that day and thinking about that day and witnessing about that day because we by faith believe Christ and have committed our soul to his keeping and we know that we are kept by Christ against that day. We the born-again ones, the redeemed ones, the washed ones will escape the great day. But we should never be 
forgetful of that day. We should always be mindful and always be witnessing and always be telling others about that day. Paul says in Romans 5, 9, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved through, from wrath through him. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, Paul is teaching us, for God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, listen. We shall be saved from wrath through Christ. We have obtained salvation and missed judgment. Church, we have reason to be encouraged because we have been saved from the wrath of God that unbelievers will be given on that great day if you know that you're missing the wrath of God because you placed your faith in the Son of God, give him praise and glory. Amen. We have many reasons to be encouraged. This was just four. Many reasons to be encouraged. We should never be discouraged. Don't let the devil discourage you. Don't let things discourage you. Let me remind you the four things, the four reasons in closing that we have to be encouraged. We need to be encouraged or we can find encouragement because of a personal knowledge of the character of Christ. For I know whom. I asked you this morning, do you know whom? Do you know him personally? Do you know him intimately? Do you know whom? We have reason to be encouraged because of personal faith in Christ and his word. For I know whom I have believed. Have you trusted Christ this morning? Have you exercised faith in him? Have you given yourself to him? Do you know him? Is he your savior? Thirdly, we have reason to be encouraged because of a personal committal to Christ's keeping. And am persuaded that he, Christ, is able to keep that, my soul, which I have given to him against that day. Have you trusted, have you totally, by faith, given him all that you are? All that you are. He won't take part of you. He must have all of you. He won't take second place. He must be the Lord of your life. And fourthly, we have great reasons to be encouraged because of personal conviction in Christ's ability to keep us against that day. He is able. He is powerful. He is mighty to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. Do you know him? Do you know him? Is he keeping you? Or are you trying to keep yourself? Does he have all of you? Or have you held back part of you? Have you believed him by faith? Do you know him personally? Can you talk to him whenever you want to? Is it that personal relationship that you have day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute? If not, why don't you come today? Why don't you come and accept him and who he is and find encouragement in Christ? Maybe you're here today and you're part of this church and maybe you're saved, but your courage has been weak. You become discouraged and you haven't found encouraged but won't you come today and say father today I find encouragement in Christ you may be here this morning and God's moved in your heart that you need to be part of this fellowship I don't normally open the doors of the church very often but if you know that Christ wants you here to be a part of this fellowship why don't you come as well as we stand and Jack and the ladies come and sing father take this message and use it for your glory touch hearts may people respond according to your leadership in christ's name Angels.
If you're lost, today's the day you need to give your heart to Him. Find encouragement in Christ. Won't you come? Father, thank you for allowing us the privilege of being in your house to sing songs of praise, to look into the word of God. Father, I find such encouragement in your word. And I pray, Father, Lord, we've been able to share that encouragement today with your people. Father, if there's any here today that's lost, may somewhere today they find a place of repentance and bow before you and come to know you as their Savior. Father, may we find encouragement continually in you. Bless today as we leave this place. Take you for safe as we go home and then bring us back tonight for this evening service. In Christ's name, amen.